Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars, and today, yeah, Auto House of Naples, on what's going to be a muggy, shitty, horrible, miserable day. I mean, you know, right now it's tolerable. It's probably in the low 70s, which sounds nice, but you can already feel the humidity in the air. I mean, the summer shit is approaching. Uh, it's just nasty. We're hitting the 90s a couple of times this week, and it's not even April yet, and it just absolutely sucks. And uh, I've pretty much had it. But, you know, I say it all the time. I say I'm going to get out of town somewhere in the middle of summer, but probably I'll be stuck here sending a giant you know, bird to jail in San Diego who's enjoying her 70 degree weather. But anyway, look, I'm going to get into this car and we're going to do a fair, I know I promise the short takes all the time and it never turns out that way, but this time it will, I'm sure, because the topic I don't think is something a bunch of people want to tune in for 45 minutes on. So we're going to bully our way through this thing and uh, we're going to talk about a couple of quick things. Uh, this is a 1970 Dodge Dart, uh, but of course it doesn't end there as is clearly obvious right now. But for the record, it's a 19. 70 Dodge Dart, uh, which was, you know, an offering from Dodge uh, Mopar that uh, actually began back in the 50s as a full-sized car. It became a mid-sized car at one point, and then in its most famous incarnation ended up as a compact car uh, that was hugely popular and sold extremely well across, you know, all genres of the American public. Uh, one thing that this generation did, and I believe this is the third generation Dodge Dart, Maybe the fourth. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but either way, this particular generation lived through the peak of the muscle car era. And as such, uh, became, in fact, one of the most famous muscle cars of all time. I know that seems a bit strange for a Dart. Uh, but in 68, they built uh, 80 of these things. Chrysler did 80 of them, which were meant to be factory instant drag cars that they slammed a 426 Hemi into. And it was like, you know, drag dropping a hydrogen bomb on everybody. You had this 3,000 pound car, uh, Chrysler's lightest vehicle, basically, uh, running their biggest engine. And uh, those cars are, of course, stratospherically expensive now, but uh, was a fascinating, and it's considered by many to be the fastest muscle car, and frankly, it probably was. Uh, power to weight, you really couldn't get much better than putting a Hemi in a Dart. Uh, but anyway, we're gonna avoid that topic for a moment, get away from the Dart thing, and get into to what this is, and obviously it's set up in a drag racing style. Uh, more to the point, it's set up in what they call Pro Street, and if you don't believe me, you can see that uh, whoever built it put a Pro Street badge on the side of that. Uh, actually, that was the factory hood scoop on those Hemi darts. Uh, these little braces they had to put in because the uh, first few hood scoops just blew off the thing, but uh, anyway, they, it is a Pro Street car, and being the age that I am, it's basically when Pro Street, as a look, as a genre of drag racing, hot rodding, whatever you want to call it, uh, came into its own, so it had a pretty big impact on me. And uh, we're very going to quickly, you know, because this is the kind of shit that gets lost, particularly with snowflakes today. Um, even car snowflakes, you know, the ones who like cars, might not be able to properly identify a pro street car. And uh, we'll get into what it is, why it is, and what it looks like. Um, personally, I've never been a serious fan or hobbyist with drag racing. I'm going to admit that. Uh, it passed me by almost in the way professional wrestling did uh, as a kid. I mean, you know, look, I, I, I was a car guy. I had that old Firebird. Uh, I raced the shit out of it on the streets, took it to the drag strip a few times, uh, you know, went to the uh, Gator Nationals, went to Super Chevy Sundays and watched the drag racing, but I never really just sat down, learned the names, the classes, the cars, that sort of thing. It just, you know, it wasn't what I was doing. I was out putting headers on my car, not really thinking about that. Uh, but this car, of course, has its roots in drag racing. And uh, basically, drag racing got its hand. Look, from the minute anyone built a car, and of course, horses before that, and camels, and, you know, the 
it probably the first time a wheel was invented, people were racing each other. You know, guys would go out and race. And of course, the car brought that to the forefront more than just about anything else because it was so moldable and customizable into something fast. So from the moment cars were built, guys started racing them and they started racing them against each other. And uh, it became kind of a thing. So, you know, dry lake beds and back roads and mountain roads and anywhere that a couple of guys could get away from the watchful eye of law enforcement and pit their cars against each other in a race, be it a quarter mile or whatever, uh, you could hear the sound of these screaming unmuffled flathead V8s in the middle of the night or, you know, out in the deserts doing their thing. And uh, it became a grassroots movement that grew and grew and grew. Uh, eventually, it became much more organized. Uh, in the early 50s, the NHRA came out. Uh, you know, it stopped being sort of this informal, impromptu event with a bunch of spectators and cars with no safety equipment and, you know, fun stuff basically became organized. And once that happened, money started coming into it. Cars got more complicated, more expensive. Uh, all of a sudden you had sponsor money, uh, people bringing that in. Then the manufacturers were getting involved because everybody liked hot cars. The muscle car era was coming into its own. They wanted to win at the race track. Uh, so they got involved. And before you knew it, it was becoming a pretty damn big deal. And uh, people were pitting their cars uh, against each other. And of course, cars became more expensive. The top tier classes became expensive, but the sport was still accessible. I mean, yeah, sure. The top tier stuff required wads of money and sponsors and, you know, incredibly expensive equipment, uh, much more so than than today because of course modern manufacturing methods have brought down the costs of some of this stuff but back then it was all done by hand and machine and uh, it all cost a damn fortune but even then any kid with a you know jacked up nova with a 350 and headers could take his car to the track and have fun with it and you know test himself against the clock and you know against his buddies and uh it was a true national pastime uh and not again as much today you know with an aging base but uh yeah but you know even then look man you know we could say that the hot rodding and drag racing is in the waning days but manufacturers are still building these 800 horsepower demons for the track and uh you know even electric cars the first thing anyone wants to do when they get an electric car is tell you how fast it is and go burn rubber up so uh i just don't think racing is something that's ever really going to go away and uh, i think um you know it's just a basic human desire uh, if not a need i mean it's just you know what we want to do uh but look let's start getting into how cars like this came to be uh particularly this dart so uh in organized racing under the top fuel dragsters and funny cars which are kind of the serious stars of the drag racing show uh, you have something called the pro stock class and by the rules these cars have to retain their factory body uh you know whatever the production cars they're based on and be powered by an engine from the same manufacturer. Beyond that, there's, you know, obviously all kinds of room for modification, but the body itself had to be the factory body. And in many ways, it was the most, uh, beloved class because you know these are basically the cars that you saw on the street uh you know obviously with extensive mods but they looked like street cars and you know the guys racing the cars could could get into them and uh you know now that class has moved so far forward you're talking about to be top end competitive you got to turn in like six second quarter miles at 200 miles per hour which is insane uh but anyway it's the look and influence of these cars that sort of uh brought about the look of cars built for street racing uh anyway in 1972 there was a guy named bill grumpy jenkins and that's a guy that i can really appreciate his name <laughs> No, I, I can I can get with Bill. Uh, but in 72, he brought out a Chevy Vega and he put a tube frame chassis under it and was one of the first, he sort of pioneered a tube frame uh, chassis for pro stock. What that let him do was tuck these enormous back tires up under the factory bodywork. And the moment he did that, the look took everybody by storm. They were stunned. It was gorgeous. And uh, people started wanting to have that look on the street. 
it became an underground movement, the pro street thing. All of a sudden, cars were getting their big tires tucked under the bodywork. Uh, you know, I had that Pinto I just bought um, at that auction while drunk. Put a picture of it up then. I'll put one up now. That was more the look at the time, you know, was these sort of wheels on the outside, wheels and tires on the, the thing jacked up, wheels and tires for traction on the outside of the car. Uh, all of a sudden now, the look is to have the back end down and the wheels tucked under. And that grew and grew and grew until probably in the late 79, a guy named Scott Selvin put together a gorgeous 67 Nova uh, with what would become the definitive pro street look. Uh, many people consider it to be sort of the first mainstream pro street car. Obviously, there were, you know, stuff like it before, but this one sort of broke the barrier. It was on every magazine cover you could imagine, and it sort of defined what would be on magazine covers for the next decade or so. I mean, pro street cars graced the covers of more magazines than L. McPherson in the 80s. They were everywhere, and uh, they were gorgeous, and that Nova was gorgeous. And at a time when cars looked a little bit like Corvette summer, you know, I mean, insane, over-the-top madness. Uh, that Nova was reserved and almost elegant. It had a lovely stance. It had near monochromatic bodywork, monochromatic bumpers. Uh, it had a stripe down the side, which would, uh, again, sort of bring that look in all through the 80s. And boom, before you know it, people were starting to make their cars, uh, the street cars, the street racers, pro street cars. The look was absolutely everywhere. And it could be extremely expensive or relatively cheap. Uh, it sort of depended on how you do it. A lot of the 80s pro street cars were what they called back halfers. Uh, instead of using like a full tube frame, which was complicated and expensive to build, uh, they cut everything off behind the, uh, you know, basically where the drive shaft would end. And they'd either narrow the leaf springs, welding them close together to let, you know, it have a very narrow rear end and put in tubs, as they would call it. The car would be tubbed out, uh, which were big aluminum wheel wells that got welded in to sort of cover the rear wheels. And that was the look at the time. That was a back halfer, uh, as opposed to having the whole car be, uh, be a tube chassis. But so, you know, as that look became famous, it started to grow and become more more commercialized. And then in the late 80s, a guy named Rick Doberton, probably mid to late 80s, fascinating guy Doberton, built a car called the, um, oh, I don't remember what it was called, but it was a Pontiac J2000. And it was an incredible pro street car. And really and truly now, you know, it reminds me a little bit of 80s music when, you know, the, in the beginning, it was sort of the, the distortion guitar and, uh, you know, a little bit rough. And by the time the end of the 80s rolled around, it was all polished and, you know, the rocker's hair looked like they'd spent three hours on it. You know, they didn't look like savages anymore. And this J2000 was so polished, every nut and bolt turned uh, to the same angle. Uh, lift off front, lift off back, almost funny car style, uh, but also not really meant to be on the track. I mean, it was what they called pro fairgrounds. It was called colloquially. Oh, God, that's a word I can't say. Colloquially. Colloquially. Doesn't matter. Anyway, the, they, you know, they, people turned their nose up at it a little bit because the thing was built to run around the fairgrounds and shows and Super Chevy Sundays more than it was meant to go out on the racetrack. And I think that was when the pro street look started to wane a little bit uh, because they basically took the drag racing out of it and made it more into a show thing. Uh, going into the 90s, that corrected itself a little bit. Um, you know, all of a sudden the pro street cars to get attention had to actually perform at the track. Uh, they had to turn in real times. They had to, you know, be as fast as they looked. And the uh, pro fairground cars kind of faded away. Um, Doberton, who built that J2000, was kind of a fascinating cat. Um, a really neat guy, an incredible car builder, incredibly talented, made a lot of money doing it, and then got a little bit bored with it and decided to come up with this thing he called the Surface Orbiter. And he and his wife spent years building this thing out of a uh, the rear end of a tanker 
truck. It was all stainless and it was absolutely gorgeous. And you could see the amount of work that went into it was epic. And they built this thing with the idea that they were going to circumnavigate the globe. So no small ambition there. Uh, it was amphibious. It could run through water. Uh, so instead of flying or, you know, boating anywhere. They were going to run this surface orbiter, and then they did. They put it all together. Uh, they set out. I think they actually successfully made it through the Panama Canal uh, and were, you know, going to keep going, but the going proved a lot rougher than anybody thought it was going to. Uh, the, his wife ended up just absolutely hating uh, the look, feel, and you know, suffering of being in the thing. It went about four miles an hour in the water. It got very terrible fuel mileage. Uh, all the rubber parts started getting hit and uh, beat up by the salt water. I think it actually capsized in Puerto Rico. But anyway, the going got pretty tough, and uh, they decided to pack it in and head back after going through the Panama Canal. It all ended in a really ugly divorce and financial ruin for uh, Rick Doberton. He had to rebuild his life after that. But, you know, at the end of the day, his wife was probably an awful person anyway, so he probably ended up in a better place than he started. Uh, that thing... He put it up for sale, didn't have many takers, and then I think it ended up in a collection in Chicago or something. But that is one of the most fascinating sort of low profile, not too often heard of vehicles of, you know, the 80s and 90s, that surface orbiter thing. Very, very cool. And uh, I wish I could get my hands on that thing. But anyway, look, it brings us back to this dart, which is a true... Uh, you know, adherent to the pro street movement. The stance is great. It's low. It's got almost a lower, if not factory stance. It has enormous tires tucked under the back. And uh, it, you know, the, the big roots blower coming through the hood was kind of the look of the almost a signature of the 80s pro street cars. Uh, this is enough with that big factory hemi scoop and, uh, you know, the air cleaner <laughs> riding high. Uh, the hood is pinned. It's fiberglass. It's light. Uh, that's allowed in a pro stock class and of course proper in a pro street car. Uh, you see it's got these beautiful five-star weld wheels. Gorge. Actually these are center lines now that I look at them. Yeah, I believe those are center lines, which is a cool wheel. Uh, you see the disc brakes behind it. You see the skinny little tires up front. Very, very cool. Uh, the dart body is exceptional. There you see the exhaust coming out right in front of the rear wheels. Look at the dish on this back tire and how deep you can see that that axle goes way way in and is narrowed and uh, it's just absolutely gorgeous to look at uh, there you see the strange axle uh, not you know strange but the company strange coming through the uh uh, the center, those are a beefed up axle meant to handle lots of torque and horsepower, which of course, as cars get faster, things break. So uh, most of these companies started uh, from people overcoming, you know, weaknesses in their cars and having to build stuff to do that. And stuff like these axles, these wheels, all of that was part of it. Um, it has that dart racing stripe at the back, which looks great. Uh, the angled Mopar look with the curved rear windshield. I love it. Darts are just really Really attractive like the taillights in the bumper um, going down low you can see the width the absolute width of those rear tires is insane uh, and uh, of course all of that is built for traction a lot of these cars also had uh, wheelie bars designed to not let the front wheels lift too high off the ground but uh, I tell you what I'm gonna do I'm gonna pause there we're gonna get the uh, uh, the trunk cover off, the hood cover off, and have a look underneath and see what we got. So bear with me one moment. All right, so I got a little help to take the hood and the uh, trunk uh, lid off neatly, and we're going to have a look inside. So uh, here at the back, you can see, you know, it's a pretty typical pro street setup. I mean, it's, you know, you got a giant fuel cell, um, you know, beautifully welded, polished, and yeah, needs a cleanup, but it's nice. Uh, you got twin Optima batteries also being held down by Trick hardware. Uh, where the pro street part comes in, you can see it's a carpeted trunk area, and uh, you've got um, a, a big uh, power line going to the amplifiers for the radio. Obviously, this is not something you're going to see in a true uh, drag-only car. Uh, like the Way the uh, big gauge battery cables coming through the floor there. Uh, there's the um, uh, what the hell is that? Yeah, that's a big fuel pump. Uh, you got more 
radio shit over there. And uh, of course, uh, high-end uh, stainless braided fuel lines everywhere. Also beautiful the way the uh, gas neck of that fuel cell goes up through the uh, center behind the back windshield into a very trick, you know, flip open racing style gas cap setup inherent to cars of the era. So a uh, beautifully finished trunk, absolutely lovely and very proper for a pro streetcar, including the way it's lightweight fiberglass and pins down. Uh, coming up to the front, and here you can see the heartbeat of this thing. Uh, so this is a 440 cubic inch uh, Chrysler wedge engine. I mean, it's, you know, a very big engine for a small car. And uh, of course, uh, that was the formula for speed at the time. We even get into those 68 Hemi darts the factory built. Uh, and in fact, they did put a 440 in these factory, I believe in the Dart GTS in the late 60s. Uh, but I'm not sure that's the way this one began. Uh, but anyway, here Here's how you make you know the thing work under the hood. You throw money at it, and you throw a lot of money at it. And obviously, somebody did that on this car. Uh, you've got these worked-over indie heads. Uh, you got a solid cam, competition cam, very radical, uh, but still enough to drive on the street. So you know, part of that pro street thing. Uh, you got Demon Carburation, a giant single-plane intake. This is all just money, 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 money. Uh, a billet front end there. That setup, I can't imagine what that cost with uh, MSD uh, alternator, you've got it, uh, uh, your polished fuel, or sorry, polished water pump there, all the billet pulleys, polished, um, you know, this is stuff you don't necessarily need on the strip, but it looks nice, and that's part of that Pro Street look, and of course, um, uh, stainless braid everywhere, MSD wires, MSD box, electric fan on the uh, polished radiator. Uh, this one uses a Mustang Fox body rack and pinion, if I read it right, which is a beautiful setup. Uh, does retain the dart frame, uh, as you can see, but of course that's it. And then you've got all these sort of uh, upgraded high-end uh, control arms and coilovers and uh, wildwood disc brakes, uh, you know, all meant to make the thing much more drivable, even than a factory dart would have been uh, and uh, does handle this giant motor with a plum so uh, anyway you can see it's beautifully finished under there very very nice and uh, just lovely to see uh, with the hood you also have these uh, raising sticks which um, you take those you plug those down on top of the pins and then the hood can be placed on top of them uh, which uh, you know ostensibly lets you work on it at the track with a little bit of shade maybe as you're there but it's much more for uh, show when you're, you know, sitting at the, uh, you know, in the fairgrounds, you have the hood up on the lift. Uh, I'll try to get a picture of that for you when I get back to the shop, and uh, it just looks cool. But anyway, what you see under here is expensive shit, time, and money, and uh, that, um, you know, that's what makes a nice pro street car. But it's not necessary for a guy who's just trying to have fun. This is more the high end of the scale. Uh, so I'm going to pause it there and get back into the car. Can't wait to drive it. So let's have a look inside. I'm not going to turn on the uh, kill switch right now because I'm going to have to get all my crap in in a minute before we drive. But uh, we'll have a, a quick peek and see what we got. So again, this is a very classic sort of pro street look. And what that means is you have the basic shell of the car complete. The door panels are as they came. Yeah, it is kind of big speakers in there, but you know, there it is. I mean, these are dart door panels. It's a dart dashboard. Obviously, these are not dart seats uh, because they're made for, you know, theoretically for racing, but also for a look. Uh, you can see it as a full roll cage welded in as well. And uh, one would argue that that's a, yeah, if you're talking about a car that can turn a well, this can't, but let's say a six or seven second quarter mile. Well, you better have a cage. Even this thing, which is probably, 
you know, I don't know. I know that uh, we'll show you the dyno figures in a minute, but you're talking 700 plus horsepower. Um, you're probably looking at an 11 second car, maybe 10. I, I don't think nines, but who knows? I don't know the way these uh, these things go these days. You know, th these were unheard of numbers when I was a kid, uh, unless you were really serious racing. But today on the streets, yeah, who knows? When your average Jaguar F type can turn in an 11 second quarter mile, uh, this thing probably does do nines but uh, that said there it is it's got um, you know basically a dart interior with the improved accoutrements uh, it's got a custom built back area for a woofer box speakers and again that's kind of a modern pro street look when, you know, stereo started becoming a thing in the 80s and now it seems like big radio has to be involved in any build. I wouldn't be bothered, to be honest, because the sound of the engine is enough, but, you know, I guess it's a thing people want and look. Uh, it's got a, a custom steering wheel. Uh, it has a tilt wheel, which makes me almost positive that that's part of that Ford rack and pinion, uh, you know, gives you a little accoutrement that Dart never had. Let me hop over this bar. Oh, God, I'm getting old for that. And there's the factory Dodge Dart instrument cluster, which is mostly not being used. You see you've got your uh, miles per hour. And, you know, other than that Rambler, this is only the second car I've ever seen that uses single digits or at least, you know, times 10 for the miles per hour, which I think is silly. I don't want to know if I'm going 5. I want to know if I'm going 50. But, uh, yeah, anyway, we'll save all that for when we have a factory dart to review. Uh, it's got this bar going across the dash, which became a very convenient uh, place to dump the gauges. And, of course, uh, when you're dealing with a car this built, you have to keep an eye on what's going on with it. Uh, so you've got your oil pressure, probably the most useful gauge in terms of knowing that you're safe. Uh, this giant monster tack, Pro Comp 2, with a shift light. That's what this thing pointing at you does. When it's time to shift, it lights up and lets you know. Uh, you can recall the highest uh, you know, if you remember Days of Thunder when Tom Cruise was blowing up the car on purpose, that was the recall thing. It let the uh, uh, the, the pit manager know how high he'd revved it. You got your water temp there, you got your trans temp, your volts, and of course fuel. And then you've got the same 12 volt fan that your school bus driver had in the 80s before they were air conditioned. Uh, when I looked down there and saw that, um, this must just be a fan thing. I thought that was part of an AC unit, which was gonna be insane, uh, but it's not. It's uh, probably just some sort of a fan. There's your Pioneer deck. Uh, you got a big USB outlet thing. Uh, this is, um, um, a turbo action shifter, very, very drag step, uh, drag step oriented. You got a switch here, which uh, is probably a line lock on this car. It locks the front wheels, lets the back spin, so you can do your smoke shows at the. Um, and no, I'm not going to do that. It's not my car. God, I'd love to, but I'm not. Uh, I suppose one could almost uh, also run nitrous off there. But it's full manual shift. You have to go one, two, three, and then downshift at the light when you stop. Uh, it takes a little getting used to, but it's fine. Uh, this runs the electric cooling fan in the front. You don't need that at the track, so it can be turned off when you're driving around the street. You do. And I don't know what those other two things are for. I actually love this uh, rearview mirror. It um, gives you a pretty cool view of the whole back and uh, makes it easier to see out. Uh, here's this book that comes with the car, which is kind of interesting. It, of course, has, uh, you know, the manuals for all the equipment with it. But here's where it kind of gets fascinating. So we get into the engine, which, again, is a 440, 11 to 1 compression, which is borderline having to use race fuel, which would do away with the pro street thing, really, if it did. Uh, you should really have a pro street car that runs on... Um, that runs on pump fuel. Uh, but anyway, it's built over. Obviously, it's going to have forged crank, forged pistons, forged rods. It's got a solid cam with big duration. Uh, it's got those indie heads that are worked over for, uh, you know, for breathing. It, it holds eight quarts of oil in a big, you know, front end pan. Uh, the MSD ignition, giant single plane intake, uh, 850 Mighty Demon carb. I mean, the thing is obviously made to run. And uh, this is a dyno 
no uh, result, which sort of proves it. So here it's, you know, look at the torque figures on this thing. Uh, you're getting into 5,000 RPM. You've got, uh, even in the high fours, you've got almost 730 foot pounds. I mean, this thing is a torque monster. Horsepower climbing over, I think the highest reading is at 6,000. So that's probably where you run out of power after that. Uh, 736. So, uh, you know, the thing's got what it needs to have under the hood to be the real deal. It's not just for show, assuming it's been put together in a way that it'll hold up at the track. So anyway, there it is. I'm going to pause for a minute, get my crap inside, and then we're going to go for a drive. All right, so we got the GoPros set up and recording. We'll see what they get. Uh, here's the master switch. We're going to get that on. That's another kind of a race thing. I'm not going to bother with the seat belts for the moment because they're kind of a pain in the ass, but uh, get over that bar. Actually, a nice and low bar, I have to say. That's made for old guys to get over. Some of these cars have higher door bars, which, uh, like in the Miata, make it absolutely miserable. So uh, here's a factory key switch, or at least factory location, I believe. You can hear I've got the um, uh, that fuel pump kicks to life pretty loud. <laughs> there is the sound of 440 built cubic inches in this uh, in this pretty cool Mopar. So, all right, I'm going to give us a cooling fan since we're going for a drive. I hit that. That turns on the electric fan. We got some fuel, which is a miracle. We got volts. Temp's good. Oil pressure's good. Uh, to shift it, we're going to go over here into first. And away we go. And again, man, as much as I'd love to beat this thing, uh, it's uh, an auto house consignment car. And I mean, I'm just not going to do that. I, First of all, you know, when I think auto house, the first thing I think is a 1970 Pro Street Dodge Dart. But beyond that, uh, it's just not my car to brutalize. So we'll give it a little bit of a go, but not, uh, not too brutal. God, it just sounds sinister. But it's also kind of reserved. I mean, it's, you know, it's obviously insane. It's hard to see around that scoop in the front. Uh, but, you know, the car is reserved enough to take to the grocery store. and wheel spin at the start and that was maybe half throttle uh, I can only imagine under full throttle at the track or racing some midwit in a hopped up Civic how much fun that would be but um, man is that dialed in uh, you felt how instantaneous those shifts were um, you know that's a built racing transmission uh, if it takes the car a long time to shift from first to second that means you lost time through the track, so uh, it's built to uh, leave at a high RPM, hard and fast, and to have very quick shifts between the gears uh, to keep those uh, to keep those times down. And it's very civilized to use. Uh, now coming to a stop, I don't like I don't like braking with the transmission. Some people do. I'm not a fan. I mean that's why you have brakes. So I'm going to come down to uh, nearly a stop before I bring it back up into uh, first gear. church meeting or you know any other number of things you do with that minivan ahead of me I mean it's just 
you know, and I think a modern pro street car kind of has to be that way. It's not going to be something you want to fix all the time or that's so fragile uh, you can't run it down the street. The only thing I'd like to have is air conditioning. figure out how to turn that damn school bus fan on. Well, anyway, there it is. So I'm not going to keep going much more than this. Uh, maybe I'll let another minute of the GoPros go. But um, I promised a short take, and I don't think I delivered. But I delivered. I tried, damn it. I tried. So uh, anyway, we'll have more fun stuff coming up. Uh, I'll do that Pinto soon, at least the uh, preliminary video, which spells out what it is, where it is, and where we're going to go with it. And uh, you can see just what a piece of shit it is compared to a car like this. So, um, anyway, thank you very much for having a look. Really appreciate it. This one is actually for sale at Auto House. So, uh, if you have an interest, give them a call, 239-263-8500 on the web at autohousenaples.com. Thank you very much for having a look. Really appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to sit here in traffic like an idiot. And we will see you with the next one. Take care.